Hey, hey, I'm Shay Keister, and I'm your host for the Casual Cattle Conversations podcast, the beef producer's place to explore new management practices. Thanks for tuning in, and welcome to the community. Hey, folks, it's Shay here, and thank you for tuning in to another episode of Casual Cattle Conversations. Today, we are going to be visiting with Nick DeCastro, and we are going to be talking about how to create alternative revenue sources for your farms and ranches. And what's really cool, so Nick is the founder and CEO of Land Trust, and it's a recreation access network. But what's so neat about this company is how mutually beneficial it is for every party involved, whether it is being beneficial for the landowner, being beneficial for the person who wants to use the land that recreationists and land trust itself. It is so mutually beneficial and designed so thoughtfully with all parties in mind. So I'm really excited to bring this episode to you and talk about how you as cattle producers, farm and farmers can create alternative revenue sources and really be more profitable as business owners. So if you are interested in learning more after listening to this episode, I do want to remind you that I have an affiliate link that is in the show notes that will allow you to learn more and sign up even if you want to do that much. So with that, let's hear from Nick. Well, Nick, it is great to have you back on the podcast. It's been quite a while since we've been able to visit before, but we are going to be talking about a lot today in a relatively short amount of time, but I guess that's a testament to the impact that land trust is making for all landowners, cattle producers, farmers, and rural communities, as well as recreationists too, but definitely focusing on the landowner aspect today. So you are the founder and CEO of Land Trust, correct? Yes. Okay. So to give listeners a little bit of background, maybe if they haven't heard our previous conversation, can you touch a little bit on why you started Land Trust and a little bit about how you would describe it if someone had never heard of it before? Sure. Well, I really appreciate you having me back on, Shay. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you, to your audience. So, um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> Land Trust at a high level, we're a land sharing marketplace, uh, specifically focused around outdoor recreation. So, what does that mean? Um, your audience may be familiar with platforms like VRBO or Airbnb or RV Share. Um, those are all uh, sharing economy marketplaces, and we're similar to them. But instead of renting somebody's home or somebody's RV, you're renting access to somebody's land for outdoor activities. Uh, we started the company around hunting, um, and hunting is definitely a, a, a core activity for what we facilitate. But also, we facilitate fishing and foraging and shed hunting and you know, we're getting more into kind of the farm and ranch experiences as well. So, uh, you know, I started the business because I wanted to use it. I don't come from agriculture. Um, I grew up hunting and fishing my whole life and uh, a great appreciation for the outdoors. Uh, I moved up to Bozeman uh, in 20, the end of 2016 and kind of was immediately confronted with what today now is land trust. Um, you know, Montana has a bunch of public land, which is amazing, and it's a great resource for people to use. But at the same time, there's a bunch of beautiful farms and ranches uh, in and around the Bozeman Valley, uh, Gallatin Valley, where Bozeman's located. And I wanted to, you know, get out there and use a property for a day or a weekend. And there was honestly no good way to do it. Um, of course, knocking on doors has existed probably since the beginning of uh, the invention of doors. But uh, frankly, it was a very um, unproductive way to try and get access to private lands, especially around kind of a metropolitan center. I mean, Bozeman's 45,000 people or so with a huge hunting community. And frankly, it's it's kind of uncomfortable. Uh, you know, in my prior life, I was a sales guy. I'm not a shy person by any means. But at the same time, you're knocking on a stranger's door. You're interrupting, especially if they're a farmer rancher, you're interrupting their day and, you know, you both know why you're knocking on the door, but you're trying to kind of like have pleasantries and beat around the bush a little bit. Um, so it just, it, it wasn't a great solution. And I wanted to find something that was a little bit more mutually beneficial because let's be honest, you know, knocking on a door and just asking to go out and hunt for free. It's kind of one-sided um, or to go out and fish or do anything like that. And landowners say yes to that. And that's totally great and, and up to them. But I was, you know, looking for an easier way to do it. That's also like, Hey, I'm happy to pay for the opportunity to go out and 
recreate on your property for a day or, you know, a couple of days or a week or something. So that's how we got to where we are today. I think that's a good point that you mentioned you were happy to pay for it. Cause I think about my family personally and we'll have, you know, those specific families who, you know, we're, I'm the fifth generation, right? So generationally mm -hmm. specific families, we've just allowed to come back and hunt. It's a great relationship, but we trust them. We know who they are. We know they're going to be respectful, all of that. When a stranger does come and knock on your door and ask to hunt, you have no idea who they are, where they're nope. from. They're, uh, chances are they're probably great people, but it's hard to have that trust and just say, yeah, go knock yourself out and know that they're going to keep get you know, close the right gates. They're going to be respectful, follow their rules and right. I mean, leave things better than they found it. So I think that's, yeah. that's a great point to bring up there. Increased profitability and informed management decisions go hand in hand. Herd Dog is a data analytics company that makes it possible for cattle producers to collect herd information efficiently. Their smart ear tag monitors cattle 24 seven. Think of it as a Fitbit for cattle. Herd Dog fits the needs of a variety of operations as it can find sick animals days before humans can detect illness, and it also identifies which cows are in heat. Best of all, the tags have a high visibility light to help you sort out which cattle you are looking for. Head to their website, which is linked in the show notes, or contact them for a consultation to see how Herd Dog can work for you. Herd Dog is spelled H-E-R-D-D-O-G-G. -G. That's two D's and two G's. What does the process look like for landowners to be a part of land trust? Sure. So <clears throat> I often joke, uh, we're probably the only person that ever, you know, knocks on a landowner's door figuratively or a farmer's door um, that's not asking them for money or control of their land. So uh, it's totally free to, you know, list with land trust and, and start participating in the market. Um, and we would try to make it as, as easy as possible and you retain all control. So a lot of your uh, listeners may, you know, they're probably familiar with in, in the hunting world, hunting leases and hunting leases have been around forever. Um, a lot of our landowners had, had probably previously tried hunting leases. And what we've heard a time and again is that they didn't like the fact that they were selling away a property right for a period of time, usually like a year or two years. Um, you know, the nice part is you're getting kind of a bigger chunk of cash up front. And so that's great. But then again, you sold a property right um, for at least a year, in most cases, in some cases, multiple years. And then you can't use the property for outdoor rec, you, your, your family, your friends, your neighbors, your business partners, etc. So, um, you know, if, if landers are interested in, you know, checking out land trust, um, you know, we have a website, landtrust.com, and there's a for landowners button, you can watch videos of other producers who've been with us for years now um, talk about their experiences, but more importantly, like you can give us a call. Uh, if you're in a handful of States uh, like your state, North Dakota, we have Austin who's based there in Fargo. Um, he comes out, he visits every single property in North Dakota and some in South Dakota. So when landowners are interested, he'll come out to your place. Um, he'll answer all your questions. If you, you know, you and your family want to, obviously there's gonna be questions. Um, take photos of the place. We'll, you know, if it's interesting, we'll build digital maps of your property and it basically will do all the work for you. So all you have to do is essentially say, yes, we're interested and we want to move forward and we'll do all of the, you know, build the listing photos, maps, arrival instructions, all that stuff for you. And then, uh, we have an onboarding team. We'll do, a, I don't know, 15 to 25 minute call, show you your listing on land trust to make sure everything is at, represented accurately. And then you go live. Um, and I can just say, from on average from the time a landowner says we're interested to getting their listing live is about seven days and then they get their first booking on average in the first couple of weeks um, of course time of year does depend you know hunting is a big activity and hunting is seasonal but um, this is something that you could get involved with and start seeing revenue from within weeks uh, it's not a big drawn out process and then you just take the commission so there's the onboarding fee and you take part of the commission and that's it no onboarding fee. No so onboarding no, there's fee? you know you don't pay us anything ever. Uh, so we're business partners. So landowners are our business partners. They're not our customers. Our customers are mutual, the guests who come on. And so land, land trust just takes a commission on transactions. So we we are completely aligned with our landowners. It's not like, hey, give us a thousand bucks and we'll hopefully, you know, make something work for you. We make zero dollars unless you make money. Uh, and so yeah, our split is 80-20. So landowner keeps 80% of bookings, we get 20%. Uh, 
Um, now we do have Farm Bureau member benefits. So if it's a if you're a Farm Bureau member, you get about I think you get five percent better. So it'd be like us uh, eighty five fifteen. Well, that's. I mean, I like a lot of things about what you just said there. Like especially how you don't make money unless the landowner makes money. So that's very mutual. But even with that, how simple and easy it is because you have team members who will go out in person and do the work. Because I think, especially in the ag community, we still like that in-person feel, that customer service. And as I've talked about different ways to create different revenue off of land or start side businesses that complement ranches, ranchers are already strapped for time. Farmers are already strapped for time. So to have something that is going to take less time out of their day and still almost serve as a little bit more of a passive income source outside of them um, accepting people to come hunt on their land. That's yep. or hike or fish or stargate. We're getting into the RV. Yeah, ride. we're getting into RVs and camping. Yeah, so it's a lot of different stuff and like shed hunting. I mean, I know a lot of farmers that would pay people to come shed hunt so they don't get uh, sheds in their tractor tires, but people, there's a big community for that. So yeah, look, we understand our farmers and ranchers, like almost, we have about a 1.5 million acres of land in roughly 40 states right now on the platform. Almost all of that's owner operator, multi-generation farm ranch families. So like, we really understand our, our partners. We understand time is at a premium and we want to be a, um, a an easy uh, extra income stream that is complementary to agriculture. This is not like, you know, it's not change all your practices so you can participate in this program. Um, so it's a, it's a really easy um, and there's significant income opportunity. I mean, we have landers who are making, you know, on the higher end, 60 to $80,000 a year right now. And that's almost pure profit, right? There's no capital expenditure for that. It's leveraging an existing asset that you have, which is your, your ground, and potentially like some lodging opportunities like a bunkhouse or, you know, lodging for land trust could be anything from we'll allow you to tent camp on our place. You could pull an RV on. we got a bunkhouse. We have a house. Some of that. So it's all existing infrastructure. And you're just basically allowing people to have access to do the things they're passionate about. And it's all do it yourself. So this isn't guided stuff. Um, it's just access. But so that figure you said on the upper end, some people are making an extra 60 to 80,000 per year of yes. profit you can bring on another family back to your ranch if you're serious mm-hmm. about that that's a big yeah, deal it, yeah we're see, i mean we're definitely seeing that we've been talking a lot to the, some of the ffas um because you know we see younger generations and we hear it more that some younger generations do want to come back to the farmer ranch and but you you know you have to be able to support yourself uh mm-hmm. most of these operations are like hey we're maxed out with what we're doing right now so we've been having conversations we're going to be actually um, doing an education uh courses next week at montana's ffa um convention here in uh in bozeman where this is a new it's a digital business that you can bring to your your operation that yeah i mean even at the 15 to 20k of just pure profit to the bottom line that might be enough to bring back a kid or you know a family it certainly it, it takes a chunk out of it right um so and as we continue to grow you know, those figures that I'm talking about are pretty much pure hunting as we continue to grow across like the RV and camping thing or, you know, farm and ranch experiences that, that number will grow. So before we dive into rural economic development, I do want to go back to something that we maybe didn't touch on, but so before I was talking about, you know, how, if we have people who continually come back to our land, we trust them. So can you talk a little bit about how cattle producers have control of who is able to be on their land? Are there background checks? Like, what does that look like so that they have the trust and confidence to allow these strangers essentially onto their property? Yeah, it's a good question. And I'm sorry to the listeners, I do have a cold, so I'm trying not to sniffle too much. Uh, so we we kind of call this just trust and safety. So we approach it from a few different directions. First and foremost, everything starts with anyone who ever makes an inquiry or booking request through Land Trust as a guest has already accepted our terms of service uh, automatically. So they're holding you harmless. Um, secondly, they'll also had to have done ID verification. So they will have had to, we use a third party for this, 
um, you know, take photos of their driver's license or, or passport, you know, take photos of themselves. Yeah, this third party does their black magic and make sure they are who they say they are. They're, you know, real, real people with their real identities. Um, because that's a big issue with the door knocking scenario, as you mentioned, like that person's anonymous. You don't know anything about them. If they do something wrong, you have no recourse, right? This is like, uh, they drove a black truck. I don't know. Um, so, you know, we do ID verification. They're booking everything on their credit card. So now we know who they are and they're paying with their credit cards. Um, people act a lot differently when you have those pieces of information, uh, rather than just like a cash deal. Then we move into, uh, ratings. So, Every transaction, every booking that happens on land trust, after that booking, the landowner rates that guest and the guest rates that landowner. And so you start building this, uh, you know, rating system and it really keeps people, uh, as I'd say, on their best behavior. Um, you know, I don't know many landowners that would have a three-star guest on their property. So, and we're tying ratings to your true identity. It's not just some random screen name, right? So um, then we get into kind of the insurance aspect. Uh, we, first of all, in the 34 ag producing states, um, there is some flavor of what they call agritainment liability limitation. So the, at the state level, they, they want to facilitate, they want farmers facilitating and ranchers facilitating these types of activities because it's new income to the farm and ranch. And so they know that liability is a big concern. So like I said, in 34 of the big ag producing states, um, they're essentially saying, Hey, for any sort of ag retainment and hunting is included in their hunting horseback riding, like any, any type of activity like this that happens on an ag operation would be covered or limit, you know, their liability would be, you know, covered from a state perspective, unless there's gross negligence, like you can't shoot your guest or something like that. Um, but as long as, you know, there's no gross negligence, they're saying, Hey, we're protecting you from that perspective. Now we move into land trust. We carry a few different types of insurances. So one, um, we have participant insurance. So even though that guest has held you the landowner harmless, if they step in a badger hole and break their leg, uh, technically they're liable for themselves. But if they're, you know, if they want to make a big deal out of it, they can come to land trust and we'll cover up to ten thousand dollars of their medical bills. Um, two is property protection. We self-insure for that. So if someone breaks a gate, you know, the fame shoots a cow. It's never happened, listeners. It's never happened, but it's brought up a lot. What if someone shoots my cow? Um, you know, they're liable for it, but if for whatever reason they don't pay for it, we will write you a check uh, up to $10,000 per incident. Um, and then we carry a million dollar general liability uh, insurance policy for all our landowners. And it's a backstop to existing policies that you have. And then I mentioned Farm Bureau earlier. Many Farm Bureaus have an aggretainment um, uh, liability kind of like rider you can add on. It's like maybe a couple hundred bucks a year. Um, and that's first dollar coverage as well. So I know I said a lot there. We try to take trust and safety very seriously. Like trust is in our name because we know that this business doesn't work unless there is trust between our landowners and us, but also the landowners and the guests. Absolutely. Well, it sounds like everyone is very well covered in multiple areas. Yeah. I mean, often when, when the idea of, and I get the concern about liability, this is where you live and work. It's your legacy. Like you're a fifth generation totally get it. It's, it's a little bit more serious than like, you know, renting your apartment on Airbnb. Um, so, but what I often ask is like, have you had anyone out on your place recently? That's not your family members. Well, yeah. And that scenario, you're, you're exposed to more liability than you are by hosting people through land trust. So it's just liability is a reality of today's world. It's unfortunate that society is so, uh, litigious. Um, so, so apt to sue, but uh, we try to take as as comprehensive an approach as we can. Look, anyone could sue anybody for anything at any time, but we try to make sure we're covered um, as well as we can be. Well, that's that's reassuring to hear, and I think just goes back to how you are really you really have worked to set up such a mutually beneficial and well thought out company for all parties involved. Now we've talked about. You know, when we talk about how mutually beneficial it is, we've talked about landowners, we've talked about the recreationists, and we talked about you guys as a company too. But something you and I have talked about before, and I heard you touch on on a different podcast as well, was the rural economic development side, which mm -hmm. a lot of us, a lot of my listeners are aware, that's huge. I mean, there are a lot of rural communities who are struggling. They might not be yes. thriving. And so- when I think about hunting season, especially in North Dakota, as soon as bird season comes about, and I'm not a hunter, but 
there are a lot of new faces, but also new recurring faces because it's hunters who come back year after year who mm-hmm. fill the hotels, fill in cabins, and That's right. are in the bar, they're in the grocery Liners, stores, they're bars, in the gas stations, yep. they're right. everywhere. <clears throat> and it's great to see a full community. So can you touch a little bit more on how Land Trust is helping rural yeah. economies? Yeah, absolutely. And actually, we've done some work with your state, North Dakota, on on kind of the rural economic piece. But if you think about what land trust essentially facilitates is rural economic development. You know, almost all of our landowners are in rural communities, and some of them are very, very rural. Um, Yeah, we do have some that are in and around larger metro areas, but they're all farmers and ranchers. And so by definition, most of them are pretty rural. Um, And by, you know, becoming a land trust landowner and listing with us, Not only are you generating income for your operation, your family, but as you mentioned, when people come into these, you know, when they come to your place, they're going to stop and get gas. They're going to go to the bar, the diner. They're going to be putting those their dollars into your community. Um, we have an example up here in, in Montana. Well, two examples I think are really good. Uh, one is in Wilson, Montana. It's a small, tiny little town. You know, I don't think even there's a stoplight. There's no stoplights, um, but a tiny little town. And three of the business owners in town are land trust landowners, and there's like four businesses. And so when they're bringing people out to their places, yes, the booking revenue goes directly to them and their operation. But everyone that goes to those properties is going into town and like eating at the bar and going to the general store and, you know, going to the the cafe. So it's helping that. And then Ekalaka, Montana, which you might be, it's closer to your neck of the woods. It's very southeast Montana, another tiny town. I think there's one stoplight there. Um, we have a bunch of landers, probably 50,000 acres of, of land across a handful of landers there. That's another very small rural community where landers are generating income for themselves, but more importantly, they're bringing those dollars into a place that, you know, is probably not a lot of people's radars. Um, but now through land trust, people from all over the country are being exposed to that, going there, visiting and bringing dollars there. Yeah, I do. I do. I've been to the Ekalaka area once, but it was, a. Uh... It was for a Red Angus tour. So I do know where it's at. (laughs) Small town for sure. Well, Nick, I, that's just really cool to me. And I, I, as we're having this conversation, I'm thoughts, a lot of thoughts are rolling through my mind as far as, well, how can we ourselves, my family, my husband and our family just, you know, do our part in helping our own operation, give back to the rural community, because I think that's something that's so so important i mean it's it's not cheap to live in a rural community i mean it's really tempting to go to the bigger city stock up on groceries do all that stuff but we also know we have to support our rural areas too so being able to do that by bringing in business is really powerful yeah for sure and again the the communities that have experienced you know kind of more national notoriety for their hunting opportunities. Like you can think of a handful of places in South Dakota. I was just out there two weekends ago, you know, South Dakota and pheasant hunting. Uh, some of those rural communities don't exist without pheasant season. I mean, mm-hmm. they, they make a huge amount of their, you know, yearly income from, from that opportunity. So we want to be able to do that for communities all over the country. And at a high level, interest wants to see a vibrant, strong, you know, agricultural, rural agricultural community and reconnect the 90, what, eight or 9% of us in the U.S. who are not producers with the one to 2% of the U.S. who are producing all of our food and fuel and fiber. Um, I was reading something recently that in 1900, I think 40% of all jobs in the U.S. were ag. And now it's like one or 2%. And so, you know, what better way to do that than to host them directly have them engage and interact with you and your family. Like when you read reviews um, on land trust, they're like paragraphs long about how great it was for those guests to meet that family and hear the story of that place and their operation and see how they do things. And then, yeah, of course they had a great time hunting or fishing or doing other stuff. But I think the most valuable thing that we can do is reconnect um, the consumer and the producer. Um, So that's it's it's really more of an ethos thing for us. Of course, we want to build a big, strong, durable business, and as our business partners, our landowners do too. But you know, we want to do it also by doing good too. Well, and that's a great point because over fifty percent of the U.S. population is at least three generations removed from agriculture, and mm-hmm. so when we're looking at 
trying to connect with local leaders, state leaders, national leaders. They need to they need to understand agriculture. The people electing them into office need to understand agriculture. It's something that we as an ag community really need to work on. But I also want to touch on, you know, we've talked a lot about hunting and we've we've mm-hmm. we've mentioned that there are other opportunities, but I just think about it. I think there's something that you could book people to do on your land year round as I think about yes. it, whether that's hunting in the summer, it's fishing. I guess if you're up north, it could be ice fishing. I mean, mm-hmm. the stargazing, the hiking, you said ATVs, horseback RV, riding, yeah, RV camping. camping. ATV is a tough one. Uh, insurance companies universally hate ATVs. <laughs> so it's a very tough one. Landers still can allow it to, uh, um, and have people sign, but RVs for sure. Look, and that's our job. Again, our landowners are our business partners. Our landowners own the asset um, and and we build the technology and market it and bring the demand. And so it's our job and in our best interest to not only have, you know, great, we have a great hunting business that's growing really, it's, we're going to grow two and a half times this year over last year. Um, and that business is really getting, getting going. But yeah, how do we make money year round with our landowners? So Hunting season is predominantly in the fall. There's spring turkey. By the way, turkeys are a huge revenue driver. So we often joke it's the gateway drug for our landowners because most ranchers don't really care about turkeys. But there are like rabid turkey hunters who will see you guys book five trips in one fall or one spring and just like hop around states. Um, but then, yeah, we have the we have the winter. We have, you know, you could do things like up in your state, ice fishing. Um, snowmobiling access Mm -hmm. Um, but in the summer you can be fishing and rv camping and you know there could be farm and ranch experiences that's a category that we're still learning but hey this is what you know come out and experience a harvest or planting or calving or you know uh, brandings or, or just you know experience farm and ranch life and it's kind of like almost showing people your chores which sounds crazy but um for people who didn't grow up in ag like it's really interesting and, you know, I think that category is going to be really big because I know as a, as a uh, guy with a young family now, I have four, three daughters under the age of four. We're constantly looking for things to do with our children and we want to spend our money with, you know, in ways that we, you know, kind of promote our beliefs, which is rural communities. And, you know, we're not going to Disneyland, but if we could go out on the weekend and take our daughters out to interact with agriculture and, and farmers and ranchers and have a fun experience, like that's a great thing. Um, and so that category is one that we're, we're learning right now. So I'm not going to say like, man, we'll blow the doors off with it for you, but we're learning it. And I think that is a going to be a really big one that farmers and ranchers can kind of like invent their own things um, mm-hmm. where it's come out and like, come out and see the place. And then, you know, Hey, you can sell direct to consumer beef or produce and that kind of stuff as well. So there's a lot of opportunity, but your head is in the right place. Like we're thinking all the time, how do we enable our landers to make money with land trust year round? Well, that's awesome. So Nick, as we kind of wrap up the conversation, you know, we've touched on how landowners can get involved in land trust, what mm-hmm. land trust is, how it's beneficial for all parties involved, plus rural communities and really sky's the limit for whatever you can imagine. You can probably make a sale off it <laughs> and they have a lot of help um yep. cattle producer landowners i should say have a lot of help in getting set up so that it's yes easy is there anything else you really want to leave my listeners with before we wrap up our conversation i would say if this is even somewhat interesting you know just reach out uh you know and i uh Shay, you've got a, a link that you'll probably share with them or and so that we can track that it's coming from your listeners, which is great. But reach out to us. It doesn't cost anything. You know, we'll chat to you on the phone. We're all real people. There's no like chat bots or anything like that. Um, you'll talk to a real live person. Um, and I, it can't hurt anything. Um, it's it's pretty darn easy to do. Once you're set up, you can run it from your phone while you're out working. Um, and, you know, it is a way to generate income that could bring back you know, a family member or a family to the farmer ranch. Uh, and that's what we want to see. We want to see a stronger agricultural community. We want to see, uh, and, and strong means profitable, first mm-hmm. and foremost. Um, so that's what we're here to do. We're here to, to drive a bunch of profitable income for rural landowners and communities, you know. 
And absolutely, I do have a link, like Nick said, that will be in the show notes. And you can use that to either learn more or get signed up. And I'd encourage you to use that link. So that way, everyone on the Land Trust team knows that uh, you were kind of referred through the show. And so we know who's out there listening. And um, but yeah, with that, Nick, have a great day. And thanks for being on the show. Appreciate you having me. And that's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation. Be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day.